<sighs> Am I doing this right? My green screen fell down. Hope you're having a good day today, software engineers. Good morning. My day has started a little dark currently. Because of this. Actually, it really did fall down. Ugh. Ah! The hooks that I had in the ceiling pulled out. Now, I didn't land on my head. Still, it wasn't the most pleasant experience, and I need to figure out a better way to get that working. And someone pointed out on the Q&A video that the audio sync was off. I don't know. Um, I'll have to look at that. So, back to the drawing board, I guess. So, let's see what we're going to do this morning. So, this morning... We are going to not talk. That's the slide I want to get to. Go back. There we go. So we're going to go into the second day of engineering software security. So remember yesterday, we talked about the main things we're concerned about when we are trying to manage um, uh, security in the engineering lifecycle. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Mainly trying to make sure that only the right people have the access to the data. The data has not changed in any way. It hasn't been corrupted. And also, it's always there. It's available. It's there when you need it. So that's the plan for, uh, that was yesterday. The plan for today is now to go through the phases of development so that we can talk about what happens during each phase. Because as we talked about, software engineering security has to go through all of the phases. It's not an add-on. It's not a module. It's not a you know, it's not something you can just tack on at the end. You have to think about it the entire time. So we're going to look at requirements, design, implementation, testing, and maintenance. Oh, there's another one on the list. Yeah, split out specification because there is a little bit of difference between how we're going to do security requirements versus security specification. Remember, requirements are how we get information from the customer. Specification are how we communicate those requirements to the developers in a way that is actionable. So we're going to do a couple different things right there. But to start with requirements, what are the things we actually care about? You know, we talked about how non-functional requirements are kind of hard to manage, right? We can do things for things like, I don't know, performance. The system needs to handle 10,000 transactions per minute per minute, per second, per minute. That's a really slow system. Um, that's something that's measurable, something that we can easily manage. Um, usability, okay, that's a little bit harder. It needs to look nice. Uh, accessibility, we could do something like, uh, for people who are colorblind, anytime that you have something that is denoted by a color, like blue, you also have an icon that means the same thing that always goes along with it. So that way, if someone is colorblind, the color doesn't trip them up. So there are ways we can we can do non-functionals, but security is a little tougher. I mean, what do you say during requirements? I want it to be secure. I want it to be where no one messes with my system. I mean, we can put it in terms of confidentiality and integrity and availability, right? I only want authorized users to see proper data. The, the system needs to not be down. I mean, these are general requirements for any system. How do we get specific for your system? Two main ways. One, misuse cases. If you remember back to when we talked about use case diagrams with requirements, we had the bad actor that was trying to take an extra turn in Monopoly. Ooh, bad guy. So a misuse case is when we can model what someone does to try to mess up your system, to try to do something that's not intended. And for each misuse case, you can go through and try to figure out, well, how am I going to handle this misuse case in any particular instance? So we can do that. The other thing that we want to do is to focus on what are the pieces of data in your system that we need to protect? What is the critical information? Now, there are different ways of thinking about this, but one way that I like is this. It's called Square. Now, this is not something I expect you to memorize by any stretch of the imagination. This is something that came out of the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon. And look, I'm going to move my face. Whoop, I moved the wrong thing. No, go back. Slides. I want to grab my face. Grab my face. Whoa. Uh -huh. Okay. So what Square is, is kind of a step-by-step -step process for thinking about um, what should you do during requirements. So, you know, step one, let's agree on the definitions. What are, what do we mean when we say critical? What do we mean when we say secure? What do we mean when we say safe? And we have to have this definition because 
customers don't always have the same thinking that the computer scientists do. So let's first agree on what we mean when we say it's safe, it's critical, it's essential, whatever. Then we need to start identifying what are the pieces of information we have to protect. Do we have any personal identifiable information? Do we have people's social security numbers or their username and password or their address or bank account or whatever it might be? Hopefully you don't have any of those in your, well, name and password, maybe. Well, maybe not password. I mean, you get the idea, right? This is information that needs to be protected. So we're identifying those assets and then we're saying, what are our goals for those? We need to ensure that only certain people see them. We need to make sure they're always available, et cetera, et cetera. So then we move on to develop the artifacts to support security requirements definition. So now we go through and say, well, can we generate new misuse cases from here? Can we generate sequence diagrams? Can we figure out what are the ways we need to protect this or how to protect this? We perform the risk assessment. Remember, oh, I moved my, interesting. I moved my camera and that messed up the, the slides. We go back to here and we look at the, um, the, the phases uh, of risk assessment. You know, we identify the risk, we analyze it, prioritize, plan, and then we mitigate those risks uh, as best we can. That's the next phase that we're trying to do. So let's go back here to square. I should probably move my face back to the top so it doesn't. Whoa, Present mode. Okay, it's working now. Now we can start going through what are our specific requirements? How do we actually now write these down that this particular piece of data must only be accessed by authorized users and then we, we keep going through and prioritize those and make sure that we've covered everything we need to cover. So this is kind of just a checklist for requirements engineers to make sure you cover everything that's necessary. Once you have that though, how do we communicate those requirements to the developers in an actionable way? So now we're gonna talk about secure specifications. Turns out in most plan driven environments in an SRS, you're going to have a predetermined way of writing down security requirements. Um, it's just a part of the SRS. In Agile, we don't do it as much because we don't really do much as documentation in general, but if you're doing something that's more security conscious, you should be doing more plan-driven stuff anyway, and there's no reason you couldn't do some of the SRS security stuff in Agile if you wanted to, because remember, it's a sliding scale. You can be more Agile, more plan-driven, and you can move back and forth as you need. So if it's a super secure system, something, you know, military grade, you're almost assuredly doing plan driven regardless. If you're doing, you know, a website like you're doing, you have security concerns. You're doing more agile stuff, but that doesn't mean you can't go in and do the risk assessment and come up with the secure requirements, secure user stories if necessary uh, to ensure that you are developing as you need to along the way. So that's the first phase. Now into design. This goes back to that notion of design trade-offs that we were talking about previously. If you're looking at different platforms, if you're looking at different languages, if you're looking at different libraries, if you're looking at different algorithms, you have to make sure you consider what are the security implications of choosing one as opposed to another. Uh, is, is one method more likely to give you... Um, let's do a really s simple example you should never do. If you're doing something where you're writing your SQL commands and you're trying to make a design decision, do I want to build the SQL queries by concatenating strings or do I want to use prepared statements in which the system looks for SQL injection attacks and removes them? Hopefully the design decision is to do the one that's more secure. That's a, that's, that's a softball, but that's the idea. <clears throat> if you if you know what you're trying to protect, if you know what data you're trying to protect, and you're looking at the design decisions around movement of that information, when do you encrypt it? How do you encrypt it? Do you decrypt it? Um, do you never decrypt it? You just encrypt the other thing and do a comparison like a hash? Are you, um, how, how do you manage data when it is in memory? Again, what are you doing at each decision point to maximize the protection needed around that data? Now, is that gonna be a conversation you have to have for every single thing in a system? No, of course not. Um, and again, this goes back to the same thing we talked about with testing. You can make a system super, super secure, but if it doesn't matter if it's super, super secure, you're not gonna get it out to the public in time and you might create more problems than, than solve. Sometimes you do have to just push it out. So try to make the most secure design decision at the time that makes sense in the context of what you're doing. Choose the better algorithm, choose the better framework, choose the better library, 
et cetera, et cetera. Now, how do you actually go about coding securely? Go take another class. <laughs> I mean, in all truth, you know, you, you learn about, you know, fundamental programming uh, for secure purposes. How do you avoid buffer overflows? How do you avoid, like I just talked about with prepared statements. Those are things you pick up in other classes. We're, we're, we're concerned in this class about the process around it. But other things that happen during implementation are things like code reviews or, you know, pull requests or things like that. So when you are in a code review scenario, when you're doing pair programming, when you're looking at a pull request, you need to be thinking about security concerns when you're evaluating other people's code. So that's how we think about it in terms of software engineering. Not necessarily the specifically how do you code for, you know, cross-site scripting. It's more how do we train our minds that when we're looking at other people's code, we are looking for those problems so that we can help them solve it. Oh, design patterns are another really good thing to think about because most design patterns have been iterated on in the context of security as well. And many of them have some kind of built-in security concerns in a sense, like some of the ways that the um, objects might interact with each other might be in a more safe way, or the way that certain things are public versus private and how those are managed. So using a design pattern is or a known framework that has been evaluated by other people. Those are always good starting places to know that you're kind of starting on good foot as far as security concerns. Um, you can also hire external people to come in and do, um, evaluations of your system. This is a pretty common thing to do. So during the implementation phase, you might bring on a contractor that's a security uh, expert during uh, the testing phase. You might bring in, and I'm going to talk about this in the next slides, but you, you could always hire a company that specializes in what's called white, white hat, uh, testing, white hat, uh, ex exploiting of a system. So, Instead of black hat, they're trying to be the good guy and, and find the fail fault so they can show them to you. You can also pe bring people in just for training. So you can go through the, you know, do training for the team, um, talk about these processes, make sure they understand them, go through their design documents to see if they're making good decisions. And it all depends on how much effort you want to put into all this, of course, um, and how much time your, your team has to do it all. In testing, I just mentioned the white hat testing. Uh, you hire a friendly company that specializes in, you know, give us your system for a month and we will beat the snot out of it and tell you everything, all the security concerns that we can find and we'll come back and, and help you with that. Um, they can help with threat modeling. So um, what is the likelihood right now in, uh, so like right now, literally right now, there are more phishing attacks going on in the, in the now time in, you know, after the fall, so to speak, um, because more and more people are doing more online. So people who send out phishing attacks, um, probably are having a good old time with it. So we have to be more diligent about educating people about security concerns. Now this, this might not necessarily fall under this testing instance, but it's a good way of thinking about what are things going on in the world right now. And then you also want to think about for availability, how are you stress testing your system? How are you testing your system under, extreme load under cyber monday sort of load when people are buying all the things or everyone's trying to buy toilet paper and clorox wipes how are you making sure that your system stays online uh penetration testing is um is a form of of security testing where whereby uh, your group or another group is, a, is trying to exploit particular vulnerabilities not only in your system but also in the um network system itself and also the operating systems that you might be installed on. So like kind of the entire DevOps operation. Um, some of these, ex these type of tests are pretty common to test for like cross-site scripting, the idea that you can get some JavaScript to run on another page or some other type of script to run on another page. Um, the problem is, is that you can't really run penetration testing until you have a fully working system usually. So often by the time you're doing a lot of penetration testing, you're going to have to go back and do quite a bit of fixing. And that's, that's cost, that's costly. Now, secure maintenance is more about perfective maintenance. Well, it's corrective maintenance because you're going to find bugs. You're going to find security flaws that you miss. So you want to go back and patch those immediately or as absolutely as soon as possible. Um, but new ways of attacking software are created all the time. And sometimes it is through um, the operating system, through the network, 
through the web server you're running on, maybe through Heroku, maybe through a database. There's always the chance that something that you didn't write is the thing that's going to have the security flaw. So how do we maintain our systems under that kind of constant potential threat? And the way we do that is security audits. So the idea is any software system that you have that, that has critical information, personally identifiable information, information that has to stay secure, you want to every year or so, probably no longer than a year, perform a security audit. Now, the, what this means is that uh, an external organization comes in, looks at your software, looks at what is it running on, what you know version are all your all the packages that all the libraries um what has changed in the world look at your design documents talk to you about what uh business practices have changed or not changed and then come up with an overall kind of threat assessment for your system so an example of this is here with berkeley has one the application security testing process and i think this one is interesting because um Ooh, move me back up here. Wee. Okay. I think this one is pretty interesting because this is, you know, similar to, I mean, it's Berkeley. It's similar to what we have at UVA, but the idea is they have a, an internal organization, the application security testing program that you know, offers a consult consultative application security assessment for applications handling that type of data. What type of data is that? Let's go look on it. Protection level P4, high, institutional information related IT resources, yada, 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 okay. Um, so security number, so uh, driver's license, ID number, tax number, financial accounts, HIPAA information, medical information, biometric. Ah, hmm, do universities have some of this information? We sure do, we have it in our medical system. If we keep going down here, protection level three, now we have FERPA records. So this would be things like which classes you're in, what your grades are. Um, <clears throat> like by FERPA, I can't tell your, like if your parent called me, parent or guardian called me, I can't tell them your grades without explicit permission because you're an adult and that's the way the, 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 the law works. And we keep going down here, um, de-identified human subject data, exams, questions and answers, those are under protection level two. So all the different data that is generated by a university, um, is at different classification levels. So what they are saying is anything that is at the super high level has to pass um, the, this, the, this, this testing compliance every year. Uh, and this verifies that something like this is always up to date. So let's think about UVA. What are some systems that we would have to make sure pass this sort of audit? Sys, Collab, right? I mean, at different levels, Sys has a lot more information than Collab does, but Collab certainly has great information and exam information. Sys has all the information. So it absolutely has to pass this sort of audit every single year. And it might seem tedious, but the goal is to protect people's information. And the landscape of software security changes pretty rapidly. So doing this sort of thing is really necessary. It's really something that you need to do to try to make sure that you are being an ethical software engineer and ensuring that you are protecting people as best you absolutely can. So, Berkeley's testing program, um, they had to you know, train people on the apps and they have to understand the potential threats. They meet with the security personnel. They understand how they get a, a, a briefing of how the system works, meet what, determine what the security risks are, and then they come up with a final report at the very end. You know, it's an audit. It's a go through. We're gonna make sure everything still looks good. Make sure you haven't done anything weird. Make sure, yeah, it's an audit. And we do this to try and make sure that uh, everything, the organization that handles sensitive data has a process to assess the security annually. It starts with the stakeholders, make sure they understand what's going on. The testing is done by an independent group so that there's no bias or as little bias as possible. Um, they're following well-documented approaches and that it addresses all the needs. So, yeah. Yep. So, in requirements, 
we are trying to identify what is the data we need to protect. By the customer's estimation, they say, these are the things that are really critical. These are things I have to protect. And you work with them to figure out, well, what are the ways people could potentially get a hold of it? What are the ways that we need to make sure that it's protected and, and, and at rest and in transit? Then once you have identified those critical assets, then we talk, then we come up with specifications and write down security requirements around those, typically through an SRS, if it's more plan driven, but we can do that regardless of more plan or more agile. When we are then designing and the engineers have taken those requirements and they are trying to figure out, <coughs> excuse me, which algorithm should I use? Which library should I use? Which framework should I use? They are keeping in mind I need to pick the thing that is going to give me the most security, the thing that's going to protect the data the best, the thing that has been tested by other people, the thing that has been proven to, to, to be uh, robust against other attacks. Um, I'm going to make sure that my system is always up to date in implementation. I'm going to make sure that uh, the DevOps portion, I'm making sure that I'm always running the latest version of the operating system. I'm making sure that I'm always using the latest version of the frameworks and packages that have all the latest fixes to them. I'm using good secure coding techniques that I learned from other classes. And I also make sure that when I'm evaluating other people's code, whether it be a pull request or a code review or pair programming, I'm thinking about these security concerns the entire time. I'm thinking about what, what should I be doing at this point to protect people's data. We now have the system going. We need to do some testing. We should have unit tests that are checking for some of these security flaws. We can hire external people to come in and do white hat testing to uh, attack our system to see if they find any flaws and they come up with reports. Um, we do penetration testing. We do load testing, do stress testing, anything we can to ensure that the availability of the system is still good. Once the system is in production and people are using it, yearly we perform security audits to ensure that we have been following proper procedure, we've been updating our system, we have all the latest patches, um, we, the landscape of security hasn't changed, and we are doing everything we possibly can at this point to make sure that our system is up to date and has not decayed in the, in the world. So this is not an easy process. Um, you know... We all, we all play a part in it from the requirements engineers through the architects, through the, through the, uh, through the uh, designers, um, all the way to the folks doing DevOps and doing maintenance at the, at the, at the end. Um, it couldn't be overwhelming. It is overwhelming. But what I want you to mostly think about here is that keep these concepts in your mind when you are designing software, when you're talking to a customer, when you are coding what should you be doing at this point to try and make sure your code is as safe as possible? All right. So we're going to pick up tomorrow and talk a little bit more about what we can do specifically in Django and in Python and, and what it could be done in your projects. Not that you have to do them right now, but I want you to kind of know what's going on. So I hope you have a wonderful day today. I'm just going to wrap myself in my, my blankie here. It'd be sad. Bye.